Hello, everyone. Um, we are going to talk today about student mental health. Um, this is not only for you to be able to recognize the signs and symptoms of the students that you work with if they're struggling with their mental health, but also how you can take care of your own mental health. So this training has been prepared by the Mental Health Association of East Tennessee. We are an organization, nonprofit, based out of Knoxville, dedicated to increasing awareness of mental health issues, decreasing the stigma associated with mental health, and advocating for those who are struggling with their mental health. My name is Caitlin Ensley. I'm the Senior Director of Education and Outreach, and I've been with the Mental Health Association of East Tennessee for six years. A portion of this training has been created by the American Psychiatric Association Foundation um, entitled Typical or Troubled. They allow us to use this presentation. So thank you to the APA. Before we move into this training, I wanted to start with this quote. Teachers affect eternity. No one can tell where their influence stops. This is a great quote for us to keep in mind as we move into the training. So over our time together today, we'll be talking about mental health in Tennessee schools. We'll be going over the typical or troubled curriculum, including the teacher's role, how to recognize stress and warning signs, starting the conversation with your students. We'll be talking about different mental illnesses, talking about treatment options, how we respond to crises, and we'll also be talking about how we can integrate mental health into the classroom and how we can take care of our own mental health. So to start off with, I want to go over some statistics with you all to help us better understand mental health within Tennessee schools. There are almost a million students in Tennessee schools, according to the Department of Education. We know that one in five of these students which makes about 195,000 students in Tennessee need mental health care at any given time. We can estimate around 100,000 students are seriously emotionally disturbed. What this means is that someone has a mental health condition that results in functional impairment, which substantially interferes with or limits the child's role or functioning in family, school, or community activities. This presentation was specifically prepared for a school within Sevier County, so I also wanted to point to specific numbers for this county. There are over 14,000 students enrolled in Sevier County schools, according to the most recently available data, which means there are about 3,000 students who need mental health care and about 1,500 that are seriously emotionally disturbed. These numbers are significant because they show us that we will be working with students struggling with their mental health. Some of these students you may already be aware of, but there are also students you may not be aware of. If you're interested in the data for your specific county, please reach out to me via email or phone. My contact information will be at the end of the presentation and in the description. The Youth Risk Behavior Survey is a national survey that monitors health-related behaviors that contribute to leading causes of death and disability among youth. The YRBS is conducted at state and local education levels to give us a better picture of the issues we may be dealing with in Tennessee. The most recently available data for Tennessee is from 2017. Based on these statistics and assuming that the average class size in a high school in Tennessee is 30 students for a classroom in the past year, nine to 10 students met the clinical symptoms of depression and other mental health conditions. Five students contemplated suicide, four students planned their suicide, and two students attempted suicide. These numbers show us how incredibly serious and common mental health issues are in high school students here in Tennessee. Most people associate mental health issues with adolescents. However, mental health issues are not something you will just see at the middle and high school level. 
mental health conditions affect children of all ages. As we can see from this slide, the average age of onset varies based on the type of diagnosis. So with anxiety disorders, the average age students will begin experiencing symptoms is at age six. Something, an anxiety disorder you may see at this young age could be separation anxiety or just generalized anxiety disorder. We'll talk more about those symptoms that you'll want to look out for here in a little bit. Anxiety is the most common diagnosis for children and adolescents. And prevalence of mental illnesses definitely increases as a child gets older. Their chance of having a mental illness increases the older they get. But mental health is an issue that needs our attention at every grade level. Early interventions from teachers and other school staff can make a significant difference in a student's outcomes. And it's also important to understand these diagnoses because um, students, they do have often multiple diagnoses within their lifetime. So when we're looking at mental health, everyone can make a difference in the life of a student. Parents are on the front line and play a direct role in shaping their child's experiences in home life. They can have both negative and positive impacts on the mental health of their child or children. If parents are open, caring, and make a safe space for their children to talk to them about things they're struggling with, those children are more resilient and feel more supported than a child whose parents talk negatively about mental health if they aren't available or react negatively when their child is struggling. Parents need to be approachable, non-judgmental, and supportive. School staff also serve in a somewhat of a parental role for students. They interact with these students every single day when they're in the school setting. So when you have this repeated contact, you also have the ability to get to know students, observe their behavior, recognize if a student is acting differently. And when they begin acting differently, this is a sign that may, they may be struggling with their mental health. So why teachers? While all school staff can have the connections with students to be able to recognize changes in behaviors, teachers have a unique role and their impact on student mental health is critical. Within a school, teachers typically have the most contact with students and are able to observe a student's behavior and not only their behavior, but their levels of educational attainment. Both can be indicators of a mental health issue. This extended contact gives you a unique opportunity to influence a student's mental health. Much of a child's behavior, specifically as it relates to their mental health, must also be examined with the content, sorry, within the context of their circumstances. Their well-being is directly tied to their caregivers, and you can be considered a caregiver to some of your students. The relationships you build with your students need to be reliable, responsive, and supportive, especially when you have a student whose home life is disrupted by abuse or neglect, or they frequently face bullying at school. You can serve as a buffer for those harsh effects on a student's mental health and reduce some of their stressors. Every day you teach your students something that could be through direct education or just behaviors they're observing. You work toward building their skills and molding them into what and who they will eventually be as adults. Part of your role is to promote mental health and give students the skills to have good mental health. Help them learn how to handle challenges and occasionally even the crises that arise. Students look up to you and how you handle things in your classroom. This goes from classroom management to academic expectations, how you react when they don't meet those expectations, and even how you may be handling the stress from your own job or from what's happening in your personal life. Students will see those behaviors and be influenced by them. If you have more awareness about how you are potentially affecting your educational environment, you can work to improve some of the ways you express your emotions in healthier ways. So it's important for you to practice good mental health as well in your daily life. If they see that from you in the classroom, it will show them another great example of how to deal with challenges outside of the classroom. Even if those challenges are in another part of the school, whether it be in the hallway or the lunchroom. And the role of a teacher has expanded to more than just stereotypical responsibilities. 
I think everyone in an educational system recognizes their role is much larger than just teaching. You are an essential worker. You're expected to adapt and educate in a completely different environment and situation currently. You may also be one of the best things in your students' lives. In this upcoming school year, your role will continue to expand to prioritize student mental health. Ultimately, their academic progress is not going to reach its potential and you're not going to be able to achieve de desired test scores if they're struggling with their mental health. So how can you help? The first way that you can help a student is by simply noticing changes and troubling signs. You may be the first person in a child's life to notice these things. Paying attention to changes and recognizing the signs of potential harm is going to be the first step in you helping that student. Once you've recognized signs of trouble, then you need to talk to the student. Lastly, as a teacher or other frontline worker in your student's life, there may be a time also when you must act on what you've seen. We'll talk about the direct steps you need to take depending on the circumstances. So I want to hear from you all. I've provided a Kakoot link in the description of this video to answer this question. This will allow us all to collaborate remotely and see what everyone else thinks about these topics. There will be additional questions that you will be able to click through in this presentation, as well as learning assessment questions at the end that may be required to answer for your employer. So go in the Kahoot, start that first question and answer this first question. What do you see as the biggest mental health issue among your students? You can pause this video now and go and answer that question. When we notice changes in behavior or attitudes from students, it can be easy to brush them off as simply being mood swings from puberty or hormones. And sometimes this is true. Honestly, it can be difficult to tell the difference sometimes. Children and adolescents are going through periods of rapid development. This development includes its changes in their physical bodies, brains, and hormones. As children get older, they work to find their independence and identity. They are under increasing stress and pressure put on, they may have pressure put on them from their families, themselves, or people at school. Your students can also face many challenges socially when it comes to fitting in or really figuring out their identity. And they must balance the demands between school, home, and other activities. As I'm sure you all know, not all students have a home life conducive to being successful in school or really being successful in life. For some students, there may be financial issues that mean they have to work a job on top of going to school to help support themselves or their families. Other issues that could cause challenges include having divorced parents, if there's violence in the home, or even substance abuse. The bottom line is that it's common for students to experience mood swings, have the occasional negative thought, have some mild to moderate and anxiety, and even exhibit impulsive behaviors. This really brings us to the point of how difficult it is to identify between those normal behaviors of childhood and the troubling behaviors of childhood. Because in reality, all of those behaviors are cause for concern, and they can be cause for concern. So how do you tell between a normal behavior and a troubling behavior? First, look at the frequency of the behavior. For example, if they go from acting out every now and then to acting out and being disruptive on a daily basis, that is definitely a cause for concern. Additionally, if you hear that they're under an escalating number of stressors, such as their parents getting divorced, or if more things are happening in their lives, the frequency and the acuity of the stressors are worsening, they may start exhibiting more serious signs of an underlying mental health condition. A stressor that's currently present for many of our students and ourselves is the coronavirus pandemic. It's very likely that we've experienced, what we've experienced in the last few months will have an impact on our students' mental health. Environmental chaos, 
has a huge impact on a child's mental health. Unfortunately, this chaos has been the defining characteristic of the pandemic, impacting everyone's sense of stability. School can be a great source of stability for students. School provides a place for social interaction, food, and education. The stability is especially important for our students that come from unstable home environments. We know that some of our students live in homes that are physically or sexually abusive. Others may be in homes where their parents or caregivers are now unemployed and struggling financially. Simply with children being home, caregivers' budgets may be stretched more thinly, meaning students may be going without meals or other essential items. Despite there being more resources to address access to food as well as rental assistance, I also know there's expanded EBT benefits, Unfortunately, some families may not be aware of resources or have the information to access them. Further, you will be working with students whose parents are essential workers. They may be scared of their parents getting sick. They may be scared of getting sick themselves. Um, their parents may be under a lot of stress at work and are stretched thin and are not able to give their needed attention to their children. And unfortunately, we know that some of the students we work with may have also lost someone they care about to the coronavirus. Each of your students are at a different place right now, one that has been disrupted across the board. And currently, this is causing a wide range of effects on their mental health. School provides structure and routine, a sense of normalcy, and predictability that allows for focus. Our students need supportive adults who can help look for signs of trauma, abuse, and help those in need. Mental health problems are sometimes a direct response to what is happening in a student's life. Traumatic events can trigger mental health problems such as depression or anxiety, especially for those that are already vulnerable. Traumatic events can include bullying, divorce, abuse, neglect, or even the current pandemic. Trauma also includes the chance a student engages in self-harm or develops other behaviors that are disruptive or addictive, simply as a way of coping. This trauma, in addition to other sources of stress, can unfortunately become persistent and toxic. When someone experiences persistent stress, it damages the brain. This brain is, sorry, this damage is especially troubling in childhood, which is, as we know, a critical time for brain development. Persistent stress can put a massive strain on academic performance as well as a student's ability to learn. Although the brain is very plastic in childhood, meaning that it's very flexible and very resilient, meaning that it can recover, the disruptions to development that are caused by persistent stress and the resulting poor mental health can unfortunately lay a very rocky and unstable foundation for the child to grow on, which can lead to lifelong issues. So here are some examples of things we should be on the lookout for that are an indication your student is dealing with more than the issues associated with typical development. In your students, you want to look for behaviors that are persistent. These can be physical symptoms such as decreased appetite or changes in eating habits, headaches, sleep disturbances, nightmares, new or recurrent bedwetting, upset stomach or vague stomach pain, or other physical symptoms without physical illness. Children, especially young children, more often have the tools they need to be able to discuss their pain as a physical health problem. So watch out, especially for students that complain of stomach aches, that fall asleep in your classroom, because those can be indications of a mental health issue. There can also be emotional and behavioral warning symptoms and signs such as loss of interest or detachment, anxiety or worry, not being able to relax, new or recurrent fears, shutting down or withdrawal, anger, crying or whining, aggressive or stubborn behavior, going back to behaviors present as a younger age such as thumb sucking, avoidance of activities, avoidance of people, persistent sadness, frequent crying, feelings of hopelessness, difficulty concentrating, panic attacks, drug and alcohol use, or even self-harm. 
Unfortunately, this is a behavior that may even be present in your younger students. The average age of onset is 12 years old, but has been observed in as children as young as six and seven. Self-harm not only includes cutting or scratching the skin, as most people are aware, but also can include burning or branding themselves, punching themselves or other objects, or even pulling their hair out. The most important indicator of troubling behaviors is if you see it persisting for two weeks or more. If the behaviors are extreme and you've noticed them for two weeks or longer, then it is time to talk to the student and let them know your concern and care for them. There are some behaviors or warning signs that you do not need to wait two weeks to intervene, and those would include self-harm, suicidal ideation, meaning they're giving you some sort of warning, sign or indication they are having thoughts of suicide, or homicidal ideation. In my role at the Mental Health Association of East Tennessee, I've been exposed to a variety of these students, and early intervention and immediate intervention is key in their success. In a moment, we'll dig deeper into ways to start the conversation, but first know that even talking to a student about what you've seen and what is troubling can have a great impact on a student's mental health. Sometimes a student knows and just needs to know they need that they're seen. They need to know that what they're dealing with is not being ignored or overlooked. Talking to your students and developing that safe space is going to be very beneficial in the long run. It's also important that you truly listen during these conversations. If there's something you can do to make your classroom a more supportive environment, you need to do it as much as possible. So let's say, for example, you have a student who's been showing some of the signs we're talking about. So for example, let's say we're back in school and you get a student in your class that you had last year. This student averaged B's all last year. They had a decent sized friend group. There were no issues you noticed that they had socializing or getting along with others. And they had a pleasant attitude in general, not only toward assignments, their peers, but you. Let's look at this same student this fall. The first month of class, you notice the student fails to pass 75% of their assignments. They're no longer friends with the people from the previous year, and you're noticing not only that, they're starting conflicts and arguments in their peer groups. They have a dismissive attitude toward you and become defiant when given a task. You notice they are withdrawn from the activities they used to enjoy. Let's say this student continues these behaviors into the second month of returning back into school. After failing another assignment, you ask the student to stay after class to talk. So right here, I'm going to ask you to move on to the next question in the Kahoot link. And unfortunately, this question will have to be, your answer, apologies, will have to be short because there's a 20 character limit. But answer this question. How would you start this conversation with the student? There are definitely a right and a wrong way to start the conversation. Our preconceived notions about mental health influence a lot of what we say to students. And there are definitely some ways our conversations can make the student feel encouraged and others that make the student feel shut down. For the student to be encouraged, the first thing we want to keep in mind while talking to them is to remain hopeful. A student may choose to open up to you and let you know what they have going on, or they may choose to lie and deny that anything has changed. Regardless of their response, keeping a hopeful perspective can be the difference between leading the conversation into a constructive one versus a harmful one. Another great practice is asking student open-ended questions that require more than just a yes or no from the student. Otherwise, the student may keep shutting off by saying the minimal amount to get out of the conversation. A good example of a conversation starter that does not leave a student is encouraged, and um, we probably all dealt with this one when your child gets home from school asking them how was their day, and they say fine. Also understand that it may feel uncomfortable for you. It's okay to feel uncomfortable with conversations about mental health. 
there is a definite generational difference in levels of comfort talking about these topics. These topics have become much more normalized in children and adolescents than they were for any of us, especially conversations about depression and anxiety. Consequently, there will be some of us that don't like opening up about our feelings or don't want to seem weak um, that make them feel vulnerable or cause us to react in defensive or defiant ways. Additionally, you may feel that having conversations about mental health compromise your position as an authority figure. Do your best to move past that thought. Having conversations about mental health will create a more welcoming environment for a student that's struggling, and they won't compromise your position as an authority figure. So when you start these conversations, try not to expect an immediate connection. Even if in the past, the student has been close to you, just remember to keep being persistent. Don't give up on the conversation or on paying attention to the student if they continue to portray those signs of trouble. Another way to make sure we approach the conversations with our student is pointing out observable behaviors and change. Observed behaviors are factual. Your student may not even realize they're doing these things. So when you ask them why, it could get them thinking as to what's occurring, where previously it might have been something they didn't notice. Unfortunately, self-awareness is not a skill many children have learned, and it is essential in maintaining good mental health, especially when you've struggled with your mental health in the past. Some things we want to avoid when speaking to our students is using patronizing or punishing language. Typically, students experiencing mental illness or poor mental health feel like they're in a place where they're alone, doing something wrong or in pain, but can't figure out why. As someone with a mental health diagnosis myself, it is very isolating, feeling like no one could possibly understand what you're feeling or how you're feeling your feelings. So being called dramatic or doing it for attention can add fuel to the fire and make them feel even more caught off from seeking help and opening up. It's not fair to our students to punish them for suffering. In fact, this is always a good strategy to have in your classroom. As we spoke about earlier, students can look up to you as an examples of how to behave and simple offhand comments can sometimes have huge effects. It's also important that we don't push our beliefs or assumptions onto the student. When we try to rationalize what the student is going through and tell them why they shouldn't feel that way, we can invalidate their feelings. This can increase their troubling feelings because it is being reinforced that what they're doing is wrong and the idea that, quote, something is wrong with me. The reason we want to avoid these things is because they can cause our student to become even more closed off, it can even make them feel alone or ignored, especially if they open up and feel like they aren't listening to what they're saying. Part of my job is to go into schools and present our youth education program to students. And one time I was invited to speak in a high school classroom. During the presentation, we talk about self-harm. And at the point in this presentation, the teacher interrupted me to say he thought that everyone who self-harmed was being ridiculous. The change in the classroom that I observed was drastic. This class had previously been very open and communicative with me, and they were then silent for the rest of the class. This one simple phrase that was communicated out loud to the students, it basically communicated to them that this was not a safe space. And we really want to create that safe space in an open environment for the students when they talk to us. The most effective way to do this is to just be genuine in your care and understand that each person is individual, as are their experiences, how they perceive those experiences and what they need to cope in a healthy way. If you don't understand what they're experiencing, it never hurts to tell students, hey, I don't understand, can you explain it to me? I want to understand, I want to learn. They are the experts of the own way they're feeling. Another part of acting on what you are saying is to potentially reach out to the parent of the students. And this may or may not be appropriate depending on your school's policies. But if you feel that it's in the student's best interest overall, reaching out to the parent may be the next step. 
Talking with the parent can help create a cohesive plan for the students in regards to tracking their behaviors and letting them know they're fully supported in both environments. It's important that when you speak to the parent that we only speak of behaviors you have specifically observed and why those concern you. Keep a positive perspective with the parent to help build a team of support for that student. Obviously, if the student has informed you of any abuse or neglect in the home or with a parent or with another caregiver, or if you have a suspicion due to some of the behaviors or other signs you've seen, you won't reach out to the parent in that case. And again, this protocol may vary based on your school's protocol, but an instance where you suspect abuse or neglect is happening, it's required to report this to the state of Tennessee, to the Department of Children's Services. According to Tennessee law, everyone in Tennessee is what's known as a mandated reporter. The step beyond that is to refer to a school counselor. So let's say you have a conversation with a student and they open up to you about what they're going through. Hopefully you have a school counselor that will know those next steps to take. And counselor, their role is to decide whether or not to reach out to outside resources. They also can provide ongoing mental health support to that student. It's important to note that even if the student does not tell you what's going on or give you further details into troubling behaviors, make the referral anyway. It's important that the counselor is aware of observable behaviors and any conversations or things you've overheard. It's good to let the counselor know of any changes in grades, attendance, as well as changes in friend groups, or even rumors that you've heard in student conversation and any bullying you know has occurred. This is very important information and that you know that the counselor may need to help determine whether the children needs further help outside of the school. If there's not a counselor at your school or in the setting you work in, communicate with your administrator your concerns and then follow up to be sure they've been addressed. So now we're going to go more in depth on specific mental illnesses that are common and seen frequently in adolescents. Our hope is that by covering this, you'll have a better understanding of the signs and symptoms of these mental illness, but also that you'll be able to better grasp what your students with existing diagnoses are dealing with. And you may also be able to better recognize when a student is struggling with a particular mental illness. With this knowledge, we believe you can provide the best environment for your students while also supporting and prioritizing their mental health. We'll begin by talking about depression. Depression along with anxiety is one of the two most common mental illnesses for adolescents and children. Depression will affect one in five students before adulthood, with it affecting one in eight every year. So when left untreated, an episode of depression or major depressive disorder can often last months or even years. Some people even have persistent and chronic depression. When someone's experiencing When someone is experiencing depression, they will either have persistent general sadness or loss of interest in activities. They may also feel unloved or hopeless about the future. There is a definite difference between sad or feeling depressed and actually having depression. If someone is experiencing their symptoms or any of these symptoms in response to the loss of a family member or even loss of an opportunity, this is normal and healthy. It's a normal response to feel sad, sadness or even anger after a loss. But general sadness lasts for a shorter period of time and is usually in reaction to something that happened. If any of these symptoms are persistent in their occurrence and severity, lasts for two weeks or longer, or impact the person's ability to function in their daily lives, this is cause for concern. To be clear, grief after a loss is normal. And if they still had that grief two weeks later, that's completely fine as well. What you're looking for is a shift in the severity of the grief and depression after the loss. If it continues to be severe and even increases in severity, that's when it could be potentially depression instead of grief. Depression occurs 
even when good things are happening in a person's life. So if you notice any of these signs, then talking to the student is the next step so you can gather more information on what's going on in their lives and how long they have been feeling that way. And just to be clear, again, even when bad things are happening in someone's life, they can experience depression and point to how long it lasts, the severity, and whether or not it's causing an impact in a person's ability to function. The next mental illness we're going to talk about is anxiety. Along with depression, anxiety is the most commonly diagnosed mental illness in the U.S. In fact, a little over 19% of Americans live with an anxiety disorder, and that makes an estimated 48 million people. Like feelings of depression, it's normal to experience feelings of anxiety and worry when we're under some sort of stress. For example, a student may feel some anxiety about an upcoming test they have. In a healthy situation, this is a positive reaction because it helps to motivate that student to prepare, study, and focus. After they take the test, they should feel relief and no longer be stressed in that the stress and anxiety they were feeling was a temporary feeling from an external cause. It's rational because the student can use logic to recognize the test is what's causing them to feel this way. By studying, they can feel more prepared and less stressed. Therefore, the source of stress is within their control. For a student with an anxiety disorder, they feel those same feelings, but almost all of the time. And the feelings they're feeling are generally more intense, they're chronic, and they may not even be able to identify why they're stressed. They can't pinpoint an event that's leading to their stress. So when someone has anxiety, the level of stress they feel compared to what's actually happening can also be much higher than it should be. And the feelings can last days, weeks, or even months. Anxiety can affect a student to the point that they may even start failing a class or avoiding certain activities or situations that make them nervous or scared. Some general symptoms of anxiety include feelings of panic, fear, and uneasiness. The student may also have troubling con trouble concentrating or exhibit irritability. You may see them twitching. They may also have physical symptoms like heart palpitations, restlessness, and problems sleeping. It is common for someone suffering from an anxiety disorder to also experience panic attacks. This graphic shows us some signs of a panic attack. We will focus on the signs that a teacher, as a teacher, you can observe and recognize in the student. Hyperventilation is a key sign that a student could be having a panic attack. They may also start crying, sweating, trembling, or shaking. When you see this occurring, it's important for you to remain calm and stay with the student. Continuing talking about how we can help a student who's having a panic attack, you can ask other students to clear the room or even take the person who's having the panic attack into the hallway to get some space. Panic attacks are often triggered by something, so it could be helpful to help them step outside of the situation. Some students may also want to sit alone in a dark room until the attack passes. Others may want to go on a walk. So it's important that you don't make any assumptions about what the student needs, but instead ask them how you can best help them. Speak to them in simple, short sentences and try to help the student focus on their breathing. It's essential that you remain calm. You can reassure them, tell them they're safe, and respond with compassion. Don't minimize what they're experiencing. You can also try grounding techniques. Um, and this can include things like offering them a textured object to feel or by encouraging the student to move and stretch. Ultimately, the student will need time to get through the attack and you should remain patient and calm. Afterwards, the student won't be 100% better from the panic attack. They won't be able to pick up like normal. There's a cooling off period. So it may be helpful to see the school counselor or nurse um, to be sure they get the additional help that they need. So now that we've talked about two of the most common mental illnesses and gone through what to do when you see experiencing, um, when you see a student experiencing a panic attack, we're going to spend a moment talking about help and treatment for students struggling with a mental illness. 
or other mental health concern. So mental illnesses and mental health needs exist on a spectrum. That means that everyone with a mental health issue will be experiencing it to a varying degree of severity, which affects the way we approach it for treatment. People with mild symptoms may be able to manage their symptoms through healthy coping and self-care. Having a daily routine of self-care can include things like getting a good night's sleep, exercising, and having supportive relationships with friends or family you can talk to, and mindfulness practices like journaling or meditation. When self-care does not alleviate symptoms, talking to a counselor or therapist will be the next best step in getting help. Different treatment and mental health responses exist to meet people where they are on the spectrum of severity. Statistically, most people who struggle with their mental health will be on the mild to moderate side of the mental health needs spectrum. One in five will have a mental illness, while less than 5% or one in 25 will have what's known as a serious mental illness. There are a few forms of treatment that can be used when someone's is a mild or moderate level of severity. So we'll specifically be talking about outpatient therapy and medication. The most typical form of treatment people think of for mental health needs is known as outpatient treatment, or it's also known as psychotherapy. This is basically a talk therapy that is provided for time-limited session, usually from 45 minutes to an hour, hour and a half, and you'll be returning home afterwards. Therapy sessions can happen multiple times a week, once a week, or even less frequently, depending on what's covered by someone's insurance, the guidelines the therapist has set, or their beliefs about how some how severe someone's case is. For most children and adolescents, outpatient treatment is always going to be the best choice. That way they can learn the important skills that you learn in therapy while in their normal environment. Whenever possible, it's also important for the family or other caregivers to participate in the treatment process. A child's mental health issues usually don't happen in isolation and there can be contributing factors in the family environment that can either help or hinder recovery. In outpatient therapy, children are given space to process their feelings and learn how to cope with an environment in healthier ways. A good therapist is much more like a teacher than the stereotypical, you know, tell me what you're feeling image that we see in TV and movies. In fact, two of the most common types of therapy, they're known as CBT and DBT. In those types of therapy, people are taught how to change their negative thinking patterns and behaviors. Many times therapists will also assign homework that could be in the form of journaling or practicing certain activities. The ultimate goal is to retrain brains to work in healthier ways. And that's why therapy is so effective for children and adolescents because their brain has that level of plasticity that adults don't necessarily have. Combined with outpatient treatment, medication can also be incredibly beneficial for a child's mental health. And to be frank, medication use um, for psychiatric concerns in children is very controversial for most people. But therapists and physicians most will recommend a combination of therapy and medication for best results. But to be clear, medication is not a substitute for teaching children self-regulation or how to deal with self-problems stressful problems, and it is most definitely not and should never be used as a way to sedate a child who is causing problems. Psych psychiatric medications should generally not be prescribed without some form of assessment from a therapist. Medication can address some of the immediate chemical imbalances that exist within the brain, but for them to be most effective, they need to be combined with some type of therapy. It's important with any form of mental health treatment that the person in need or their parents or caregivers advocate for what they need and want out of their experience. It is definitely possible for there to be bad mental health treatment. And in that cases, in those cases, it can do more harm than good. So we're going to take a few minutes to listen to some Tennessee students speak about their own experiences with mental illness. They share what has helped them and how being proactive in their mental health has made a huge difference in their lives. I've linked the original video in the description.
I think I was in like the third grade when I got diagnosed with ADHD and I was constantly getting in trouble. I couldn't, couldn't sit still, I couldn't listen, couldn't do anything that anybody asked me to do. About middle school I started experimenting with uh, drugs and trying to self-medicate. A very early age I was diagnosed with depression. I would just feel these strong feelings that something was wrong. I couldn't articulate them. I didn't have any of the kind of tools to even know kind of what I was feeling. I was known as the happy kid who could never stop smiling. And then suddenly I was losing weight. I was being super quiet and crying all the time. It feels like lots of people tell you what to do instead of ask you how you feel. Ask the kid what they think if they ask you a question. The result is a person that feel like they have an opinion that matters. Support groups have done so much for me because I'll feel less alone. And second, I can socialize with other people who have the same kind of brain like me. What I've realized now after a lot of work, a lot of therapy, etc., is that during the times when it's good, that the work really gets done. You know, whether I'm having a good day or a bad day, I have to take steps to um, not get that way again. You know, every day I kind of look back on where I was at versus where I'm at today. Even when things are good, I still have to proactively do things to make sure I don't fall back into that dark time in my life. If you let yourself jump into the hole with a therapist or with a friend or in a safe way, you have the opportunity to climb back out. You know, you can give all the wisdom in the world, but listening, I think, is the most wise thing an adult can do. That was a great video that really showed the real teen experience and I think speaks to an important point that listening can be a very essential step. So many children and adolescents are told how they should feel or what they should be doing. Giving them a little bit of power and space to express their feelings can make them feel more confident. So in an ideal world, we would have the opportunity to intervene with our students before crisis, specifically when a child is suicidal. Unfortunately, we don't always recognize the gradual process that may happen before a student reaches a point of suicidal ideation. Just to be clear, Suicidal thoughts, suicidal action don't come out of nowhere. There will always be a lead up. Whether or not that lead up is recognized, that is why sometimes people interpret it as a suicide that came out of nowhere. So just like we've talked about through this presentation, the three key steps you can take are to notice signs, talk to the student, and act by getting the student the help they need. Unfortunately, suicide is the second leading cause of death for youth ages 10 to 19 in Tennessee. And thinking back to the statistics we talked about in the beginning, where we talked about 30, the average of 30 student classroom, that means five students contemplate suicide each year. And unfortunately, the rates of suicide are increasing, especially in youth in Tennessee. Not that long ago, suicide was only the third leading cause of death for young people. Suicide is preventable. In fact, if people in crisis receive the help they need, then they will most likely never be suicidal again. More than 80% of people who attempt suicide once never attempt again. 90% of this time, someone will give an indicator that they're planning to attempt suicide. So let's start by discussing some of the signs you can notice and look out for in your students. This image shows us some key behaviors that we can observe without even talking to the student. Actions like giving away items to friends or loved ones. For example, maybe the student has a favorite sweatshirt they wear all the time, but then one day they give it to a friend saying they want them to have it. Engaging in the use of drugs or alcohol is also cause for concern. Between 20 and 66 percent of people who die by suicide have a positive blood alcohol content at the time of death. So there is evidence that shows that someone who is having thoughts of suicide may use drugs or alcohol to lessen their inhibition and act on those thoughts. Social isolation is something you can look out for when a student becomes reclusive. 
no longer socializes in your classroom or begins missing more school. They could also exhibit aggressiveness or irritability that seems out of character. They may talk about feeling worthless, frequently talk about death, or have dramatic changes in mood or behavior. These changes in mood can go either way. We typically think of someone becoming quieter and more reserved and withdrawing, but someone who's made the decision to attempt suicide may also feel some type of relief from being able to make that decision and they may start to show more happiness or joy than is usual for them. Kevin Hines, who is a well-known public speaker on the topic of suicide, talks about how he, as a man with bipolar disorder, had a period of behavior that where he became increasingly aggressive and withdrawn, but when he had finally made the decision to take his life, he felt at peace. And so his behaviors were not as erratic anymore. So any changes in behavior, especially sudden, are things to pay attention to. So if you notice any of these signs, then it is time to talk with the student. These are examples of conversation starters that you can ask the student to offer them a safe space to talk and open up about how they're feeling. Let's think about back to our example of how to start a student, how to start a conversation with a student who's exhibiting those troubling signs of a mental health issue. Those same do's and don'ts remain true here. We want to approach the student in a caring and non-judgmental way and try to be sure that our words make them feel comfortable and encouraged instead of shut down. The most important question to ask directly is, are you thinking about suicide? It's a common myth that talking about suicide will give someone the idea. That is not the case. People also tend to beat around the bush and try not to directly mention suicide. They may ask things like, have you thought about hurting yourself or, or things like that. But it's important that you be clear and direct with your question. Asking someone directly about suicide can then lower their anxiety about the topic, give them the chance to open up about what they're going through, and it can actually lower the risk of an impulsive act. So I'll give you an example of how this actually works. There was one time through my program that I was in a middle school in East Tennessee. At the end of the presentation, I was approached by a young woman who asked, if someone says they're going to kill themselves, but you think they may be joking, should you take it seriously? This is a common question we get in schools. How seriously should joking about suicide be taken? So I responded, of course you should take it seriously. Because when we have that conversation, if they're not thinking about suicide, it's no harm, no foul. But when they are, again, it brings us back to being able to start that conversation. So in this particular case, I said, you know, of course you should take it seriously. So she told me the name of the student and then what he had said. And luckily the counselor was right next to me and approached the student who she referenced and asked him, do you really want to kill yourself? And he immediately responded, sometimes, yeah. And it wasn't a comfortable question for him to answer, but he answered it simply by having that conversation. At one simple question, the counselor was now aware of the suicidal ideation the student was having and could then take the appropriate steps to get him help, tell his parents, and not only that, keep a closer eye on him when he was in the school. There are different risk levels of suicidality. Regardless of risk, we want to be sure to intervene and act. But what we do and how we do it is going to differ based on the risk based on the level of risk. So low level risk is when an individual has suicidal thoughts, but no plan on how they will attempt suicide and they say well, they will not act on it. To be frank, low level suicidality is not uncommon, especially in adolescents. Many of us can even recall having some of these, I like to call them passive thoughts, passive suicidal thoughts about ourselves during teenage years. Often, thoughts like these indicate more of a desire to escape a stressful situation than a desire to die. Mid-level risk is when an individual has suicidal thoughts and has a specific plan on how they will carry out their suicide attempt. 
Those who are mid-level risk may even say that they're planning to act on it or may say that they do not plan to act on it. In either case, if a student is having suicidal ideations, they have to be referred to someone immediately. That could be the school counselor. And this person will be able to conduct a thorough assessment of the student to determine their risk level and create a plan for the next best steps for that student, which is typically known as a safety plan. As a teacher, it's not your responsibility to determine the level of severity of the student, but knowing these differences will help you to know how quickly you need to act. Again, if a counselor is not present within your school, it's still not your job to make that assessment. You or an administrator should call a mobile crisis agency that is assigned to your area. In many areas of Tennessee, this agency is Youth Villages. So if the student says they won't act on it and they don't have a specific plan, then you need to act by referring them to the school counselor or letting the administrator know about it. Ideally, having the student go directly to the school counselor is going to be the next best step. Informing the counselor of the specific signs you've noticed and the conversations you've had with the student will be helpful in giving the counselor more background information. If the student is mid-level risk, it's time to take action immediately. The exact steps you take will be specific to your workplace or school's suicide threat protocols. If you're not familiar with these, please reach out to an administrator to get these protocols so you can be aware of them. What I'll be talking about in the next few minutes are some general steps and recommendations you can take with a mid-level risk student, but may vary slightly based on the specific protocol for your place of employment. First, do not leave the student alone for any amount of time. That means you need to send another teacher or student to contact the school counselor or administrator immediately. Remain calm and stay with the student. Keep in mind that the student may be overwhelmed, confused, or even ambivalent. Get vital information as, if possible, such as name, address, home phone number, and a parent or guardian work number or cell number. Clear other students from the scene, direct them to another classroom or area. Assure the student that they've done the right thing by talking to you. Assure the student that help is coming and tell them that there are options available. The biggest thing we need to focus on is hope. And then lastly, a parent or guardian must be contacted immediately. You do not want to minimize the student's threat. Take it seriously. Also, don't leave the student don't lose, lose patience with the student. Allow for silence. Give the student time to talk. Don't argue with the student about whether suicide or, is right or wrong. Like we talked about earlier, your personal beliefs on these topics don't really have a place in this conversation because they can put up barriers and walls with that student. And lastly, it's important to not promise confidentiality. Tell the student that you're required by state law to report the situation to the parent or guardian. Also tell the student that help is available and that you're going to state the process for getting help. So those are some of the ways that we can recognize when specific students are struggling. But there are some great things we can do to normalize mental health in whatever setting we're in. And one of the best ways we can do this is by incorporating mental health into the class and throughout your school. So we can take steps to prioritize mental health and this can look like a variety of different things. It's important to know that even small changes can have a large impact on the overall health of your students. And so that means it doesn't require too much of a change or too much work to implement these tools. It can be simple and straightforward as long as we have a deliberate effort. So there are different things that can be done to promote mental health in your workplace or school. First, it's important to create a culture within your place of work or your school where discussion of mental health is acceptable and normalized. Beyond that, it's important to integrate mental health wherever you can to the way a classroom is conducted, to also how teachers and staff are supported for their own mental health. No matter what area of school you work in or what subject you teach, you can incorporate mental health into your daily interactions with students. 
we're going to go through some additional tools and ideas that you can utilize in your classroom. This is just one example of a project that was done by a middle school language arts teacher in Alabama. They worked with her students to complete this school-wide project called the I Am Wall. We're going to watch a video demonstrating this concept and how it came together. Yeah. 
Another great tool, especially for the start of the year, is to create a classroom rules list. I'm sure this is something you may have seen or used in the past, but this classroom rules list is going to be specifically targeted toward the mental health of your students. So on the first day with a group of students, you could do this as a group project or even have student write down one rule that would make them feel safe to express their thoughts and emotions in the space you've created for them. Creating this list together can show the students you want to prioritize their feelings and emotions, and it can be the foundation of building a safe space. It also helps the students to feel heard. It's important that if you create this rules list, you want to be sure to implement and follow up when their rules may be broken. We've talked earlier about environmental chaos. A lot of stress and anxiety is caused in students when they don't know what to expect. So say one of your rules is that a student can't interrupt another while they're discussing what they feel. If a student proceeds to break this rule, have the consequence ready and implement them. This will not only let your students know the importance of practicing mental health, but can help the student who is feeling interrupted to feel supported and know that they're in a safe space that they can rely on the rules. There are also daily exercises that can be incorporated and emphasize the importance of mental health. One easy way is to include a daily journaling time. This could be a part of your classroom warm up and have it done in the first five minutes of class. Let the student know that these journals are private and for their eyes only. Have them write a few sentences about how they're feeling or what's going on that could be causing them stress. Another great way to practice daily mental health is by implementing a period of mindfulness minutes. This would be a great exercise for the end of class. Maybe the last three minutes, have the students close their eyes or put their heads down and count their pulse. This can give them a quick breather to calm down before they run off to the next thing they're doing or their next class or even home. Another option is to have a mental health check-in list posted in the classroom. This can be something that the students use each day or a few times in a day. You can get different color sticky notes for each check-in and have the student write where they are on the back of the sticky note and post it in the correct block if they need you to speak with them or if they're feeling great that day. You can also include similar tasks on homework and other assignments. A good question to ask on assignment may be, how are you coping with your stress? If a student gives you an answer that's concerning, like they're scratching their skin or they like to punch walls, take the time to talk to the student about some healthier alternatives. This will not only help them reflect on themselves, but learn healthier ways they may not otherwise be shown. And these are just some of examples of daily exercises that could be incorporated into your classroom. We see this writing prompts, thumbs up Thursday, what is one thing that happened this week that was really good. We also see this mental health checklist. On the back they write their name so you can check in with them. And here's another prompt. Tell us something Tuesday. What is the one thing that most people don't know about you? Recognize that your students are more than just their academic performance and that their mental health is a key part of who they are. We just talked about using mindfulness minutes in the classroom, but I also wanted to show you a video of students talking about how mindfulness has helped them manage their thoughts and emotions and giving them power over how they react to different situations. You will hear from teenagers about how mindfulness has changed their lives for the better. If we will also go through a video that you can use in your own classroom that leads viewers through a five minute meditation. Both of these videos will be linked in the description as well. Before I tried mindfulness, I felt threatened all the time. Really disillusioned with life. Confused. Tired. Stressed. Frustrated. Scattered all over the place. Overwhelmed. Anxiety over the future. Worried. It was kind of taking over my life. I tried mindfulness because I felt stressed out. I was very concerned with the future and what my day was gonna look like tomorrow and everything that was happening. My life was always about what happened in the past and what's gonna happen in the future. So by doing mindfulness, I live much more in the now. It is just a different approach to life. We all experience difficult challenges in our life, like stress, pain, and depression. Mindfulness can give us resilience 
to rise above those challenges and live life more fully. Mindfulness is a particular type of meditation where we bring our awareness to the present moment. We can let go of the past, let go of the future, live life more fully, more joyfully. We all are too busy. I think it's a thing that everybody's just so busy all the time right now. You always have something that you have to do or you're always going towards a certain goal. And mindfulness is just taking a moment to look at your life without any expectations. Take time for yourself rather than getting carried off in all the daily activities that you have. Mindfulness can be practiced by anyone, no matter what your religion, your age, or your background. We don't have to wait until we have time to do like a formal sitting meditation to practice mindfulness. We can bring that same mindful awareness to any activity that we're doing through our daily lives. So walking can be a meditation, eating our lunch, brushing our teeth, being creative, painting, writing, or playing music can get us deeply in touch with the present moment. Mindfulness is available anytime, anywhere. It's a tool and skill that you can use for the rest of your life, and it's, it's easy through simple daily or not daily exercises. I mean, it just keeps us all just calm and present, and I think that that's healthy for anybody. It can be beneficial for everyone, and you just have to go in with an open mind and take everything slowly instead of trying to get through life quickly and do as much as I can, and as fast as I can do it. Instead, just enjoy everything you do and maybe look at life from a more positive perspective. So I really invite you all to try it to experience it and to see for yourself how mindfulness might be able to affect and transform your own life. Before I That was a great video that shows us just what a difference mindfulness can make in students. And many schools are incorporating some of these practices in their daily classroom as well. So I'm sure you've heard before that communication is a two-way street. Communication is essential for the mental health of your students. So instead of simple, simply lecturing or talking to students, Incorporate small discussions or open-ended questions to give students the opportunities to voice their opinions, feelings, or experiences. As I said previously, children and adolescents are so used to being told how they should feel or what they should do that it's really refreshing for them to have a little bit of power. This is especially important considering the situation our students are returning to this fall, fall 2020. So it's important that we go into the new school year expecting a change in our students. There will be change in their behavior, how they interact with each other or with you. There will be an increase in mental health needs and so education on mental health will need to be prioritized and implemented in your classroom. Give students time to talk about how they felt through the coronavirus pandemic and share with them your own stress, struggles, and emotion. And can, that can help them realize that everyone was impacted, that they're not alone. I would suggest planning on setting aside time for an open conversation the first time you meet back with students. Also expect that students will have issues focusing and that concentration will be broken easily. It may take a while for students to start meeting academic and behavioral expectations. And it's very expected that there will be what's known as a COVID-19 slide. So there will be a significant loss of learning. And with over six months out of school, for many of our students, routines will have to be relearned and classroom expectations will have to be relearned. This will take time and patience from you and from your students. So it's important that you're as flexible as possible. Another great way you can prioritize mental health in your classroom is to find ways to integrate it into your curriculum. One of the best ways that this can be done is just by providing general mental health education to your students. And this includes education about stress and coping, what it looks like to help someone who's struggling with their mental health. We at the Mental Health Association of East Tennessee have a curriculum, um, a presentation program called Mental Health 101. We've been doing this since 2000 and it can be utilized in fifth grade and up and it provides students with understanding of what mental health looks like specifically to them. 
we take a strengths-based approach and we focus on healthy versus unhealthy ways to cope, what mental illness looks like. We also talk about self-harm, stigma, how to talk to your friends, and how to reach out to an adult to get help. We only speak to small groups because of the nature of this subject material and have age-appropriate materials for each grade level. Sometimes it can actually be better for students to receive this information from someone outside of the school. This is especially true for those students who may be struggling with some trust issues with their adults within the school setting. They've made connections. So we've made, been able to make, because of our relationships, connections and referrals for students that come up to us after the program because they open up to us about what they have going on. Sometimes the school is already aware of the issue, but may not even be aware of the issue and how severe it is in that moment. And we're available year round to speak to students based on what works best for schools. And we can also work with schools to consult with them on how to address a particular issue. My email and contact um, information will be listed at the end of this training. When we prioritize mental health in the classroom or enforce practicing good mental health for our students, we create a safe environment. This is a place where everyone is in the same boat and same playing field when it comes to learning how to take care of their minds as we are challenged and stressed out from time to time. It's all something we deal with regardless of socioeconomic status, status race, ethnicity, etc. So providing these tools for your students will increase their knowledge of the connection between their thoughts, feelings, and actions. And when those are negative or harmful, unfortunately, it can be difficult to break away or feel motivated to go down a different path, especially when students have formed bad habits. Practicing tools creates new habits. Not only that, it allows the student to learn more about themselves in a productive way. It can help them go down a healthier path. So tools can shape you into a teacher that makes a student feel safe. Your classroom can be their safe space or the place they trust they can be themselves. And it's a great feeling when you know that it's a welcoming space for your students. And it may be the best time of their day or when they have the most peace. The tools that you use in your classroom will also reveal themselves outside of the classroom. For example, if a student happens to enjoy journaling during the warm-up, they may start doing it at home to process what they're dealing with, or they may find the mindful minutes really helpful. So they start practicing these or doing yoga to cope. Ultimately, you're setting themselves, you're setting them up for success outside of the classroom when you enable them to be successful inside of the classroom. Learning how to handle the stress of school can translate how they cope with other stressors outside of school. And the last thing we're going to talk about today is the importance of managing your own stress and finding healthy ways to cope with the challenges you may face as a teacher. So move into the next question in Kahoot and answer this question. What is one way you practice good mental health for yourself? Again, keep the answer short as there's a limit in the question field. So in order to help your students have good mental health, you have to look at your own wellness first. The saying that you can't pour from an empty cup applies to school staff as well. Even if we think we're doing a good job of handling the own stressors in our lives and not passing them along to students, it's important to be as self-aware as we can to recognize how, the behave, how we behave and act influence our students. So this comes down to starting with what we know as basic self-care. Look at your nutrition, sleep, proper exercise, and make sure you spend time outside each day. I always say that focusing on your sleep can be a wonderful foundation for wellness in every other part of your life. But beyond that, it can sometimes take more. So hobbies or other creative activities can be a great way to alleviate stress. I mentioned journaling as a good way for students to cope, but many adults find this beneficial as well. It can help us process our feelings and hold ourselves accountable. It can also sort of focus, force us to take a few moments alone in a peaceful setting to just have a break from the day 
and the power of a break can't be underestimated. Being creative in general is a great way to de-stress. If you like to draw, sing, garden, or work with your hands in any way, these types of hobbies are great outlets for self-expression and can be positive mental health practices. It's important to set boundaries for ourselves as well. This will vary from each of us by what works best, but they're necessary for us to prevent burnout and make sure we can provide healthy relationships for our students. Some boundaries that work for most of us are creating a schedule we can stick to, including when we are going to be grading as well as setting specific hours for individual times or conversations with a student. Also make sure you force yourself to take a break. Make a specific time during the day that is non-negotiable for you. Close the door, go take a walk, be sure to find time for yourself during the day. Another way to prioritize mental health is by setting proper goals. It's important to set balanced goals that motivate you to perform at your best. One way to hold yourself accountable when it comes to goal setting is by creating a support system. This can be great at work as te teachers typically understand the stresses of work more so than those who don't teach. So having a coworker that encourages your goals or serves as a great partner to vent to can be beneficial to have day to day. Lastly, make each day that you have a fresh start. Holding on to negative behaviors of those around you can drain you. And if that continues to build up, it can make each day harder, increase negative thinking, and make, new, make each new incident even harder to deal with. Making that effort to start each day on a positive note will help you and your students. And not only will you be taking care of your own mental health, your students observe these behaviors and you become an example on dealing with mental health problems in an effective and healthy way. So this is the last video we'll be watching together today. Again, the link is in the description. So you can choose to skip past it in this training. But this video is going to walk us through a five minute breathing exercise and meditation. This is not only a great way for you to de-stress and center yourself, but it can be something you utilize with the students you work with as well. Hey there, and thanks for gifting yourself these next few minutes. It's important to remember that you're a priority and allowing yourself even just a few short minutes of intentional reflection can really have a positive impact on the rest of your day. So let's use these next few minutes to come back to center and set an intention for the rest of your day. Move into a comfortable position, whether you're seated at your desk at work or laying on the couch at home, and gently close your eyes and shift all of your attention onto your breathing, taking slower, deeper breaths than you've taken all day so far. Taking a deep breath in through your nose and slowly letting it out through your mouth. And continuing to breathe that way, feeling your lungs expand out as you inhale and contract back in as you exhale. Tune into your body, noticing how it feels, noticing if there's anything that it's trying to tell you. Notice any place of tension or tightness in your body give those areas permission to relax sending love into those areas thank your body for taking such good care of you and let it know that it's okay to rest and relax for these next few minutes you may notice that your mind starts to wander off that's okay that's natural just notice it and bring your attention back to your body, using your breath as your anchor. Try to picture one thing that's happened today that's made you smile or made you thankful or appreciative. And just let that feeling fill you up for a moment. Breathe that feeling in from the top of your head to the tips of your toes and allow yourself to smile if that feels natural. Now focus on something that you can do today, whether it's for yourself or for someone else, 
that will allow you to continue feeling this way. It could be something as small as deciding to go to bed early tonight so that you have time to finally read that book that's been on your bedside table or the joy of getting dinner with a close friend. What's one little thing you can plan for your day to bring that intentional joy to it? Now just focus on that for a few minutes. Sit in that feeling of joy and peace. Take a few more deep breaths together, a deep breath in, feeling your lungs expand out as you inhale, and everything contract back in as you exhale. Again, an even deeper breath than the one before it, holding that breath for a beat, and exhaling everything out. Last time, your deepest breath yet, sending that breath through your entire body. And exhale it out. And in your own time, slowly bring your awareness back to where you are. And thank yourself for taking these few minutes to just be intentional and kind to yourself. And when you're ready, you can gently open your eyes and enjoy the rest of your day. was an absolutely wonderful mindfulness meditation. Many of us feel guilty about taking breaks during our workday or even on the weekends because we think we have to be very productive. But a question I encourage you to ask yourself is, how much time are you wasting feeling stressed? Are you producing your best work when you're preoccupied with anxiety or depression? Taking those moments for yourself puts you in a better place to be more productive and make those changes in your life that you want to. Lastly, some things we're going to talk about are some helpful websites you can access. So we at the Mental Health Association, we have a lot of resources on our website you can utilize. We also can um, answer any calls you have at the number listed on this slide. The American Psychiatric Association, also a great resource. And here are just two more resources on mental health that you can find very informative and insightful. And of course, working with children and adolescents, we know that utilization of technology is very big. So here are a few apps that you can recommend or you can even use for yourself that promote healthy mental health. So I appreciate you taking the time to watch this training. If you have any questions or would like to schedule Mental Health 101 for your classroom, I have my contact information listed here for your reference. I'd also be happy to speak with you individually about some of the steps you can take or your workplace can take to improve just general mental health education or make it more acceptable to be having those conversations. If you've been asked to complete this training for your workplace, I ask that you go back to the Kahoot, or if you're just watching this training um, because, 
go back to this Kahoot and finish up the rest of the questions. They'll not only assess your learning, but give you an opportunity to provide feedback. I'd also love if you have any comments or questions, we can create some discussion in the comment section for this YouTube video. Anyway, I hope you have a wonderful day and keep mental health in mind. It is so, so essential, not only for ourselves, but for the students we work with.